Greetings and salutations, fellow consumers of banal superhero media. It is I, Eric J. Chucky, joined, as always, by the boy. Hey! This is the Two Nerds Podcast. Before we get into it, do you see the ticker at the bottom of the screen? It is telling you cool stuff about things you can click in the description of this video and help fund my existence. Uh, if you give us at least a dollar on Patreon, I know that's not much, but that's all I'm asking, we will talk about how cool you are. Uh, which puts you in such lauded uh, company as a guy from Ohio, Rob, uh, Passion Killer 7-Eleven, and Jesse Weak. We appreciate you all very deeply, and you're the coolest people we know. So, you may wonder, uh, why the fuck are we doing a podcast on this random movie from 2021 that isn't really in our wheelhouse? Uh, it's not really nerd shit related at all. Uh, that's because we do another series, you may have seen, uh, in the podcast, if you watch it, which you don't, you watch Journey of Wrestling, um, called Two Nerds Go, Don't Go to the Movies, where we look at the movies that came out and in some number of months, usually, and see if it's on us that we didn't go see this movie, or if it's on the movie that we didn't go see this movie. Or some other factor, like it, it containing, uh, you know, some actor, actress, person we don't care for. If it's on a weird streaming service that no one's ever heard of, like Klinlu. If it's... Uh, yeah, just like yeah. why we have missed this movie. Uh, and this was, this was uh, created, you know, this idea came to us, the genesis of this project. Because so many film snobs love to talk about how there are too many superhero movies and not enough regular movies. And that's just fundamentally bullshit. Yeah, the vast, vast majority of movies that come out are not superhero movies. Y'all just don't go see those. Well, and I mean, it's just, you know, there are more movies, period, now. It's not like they have been replaced. There's just more. There's extra. Um... So, you know, I, I, I like films. I have been trying over the past couple years to watch more movies, whether those are classics I've missed or, you know, new films that just perk my interest and, and make me want to watch a movie. Uh, I watched a lot of movies when I was a kid. I also have been trying to watch more movies. I've been failing. Uh, <laughs> but it is something I used to do a lot of. And as I get older, I just watch fewer and fewer movies that aren't superhero movies. Yeah, um, so uh, as an additional part of the Two Nerds Don't Go to the Movies, when we see a film that piques our interest... That looks like it might be good for whatever reason. Uh, we write it down and um, make a point to check it out. And as mentioned, uh, we're, we're here to talk about some of those movies. Yeah, uh, we decided to um, pick one out of the list of movies we've got so far from the episodes of Two Nerds Don't Go to the Movies we've done. And we ultimately settled on Nightmare Alley. A period piece set in the late 30s and early 40s, um, and starring several actors who seemed very interesting, and done by Guillermo del Toro, a creator who can usually be relied upon to tell a fun and entertaining story. Or at least entertaining. Yeah, at least entertaining. I, and I, we're going to go into this with a lot of uh, spoiler alert criticism. In fact, spoiler free review of the movie, um, don't watch it, it's dumb. <laughs> Watch the one from the 1940s or read the book. Yeah. Both are literally better. Yeah. Um, now, there are incredible actors' performances in this. I feel like the cinematography was very good and the uh, well, the atmosphere. Yeah, it does a great job of setting tone at the beginning. Uh, it has excellent set design, excellent costume design, and for the most part, given the material they have to work with, the actors do a fine job. Um... However, the material they have to work with is subpar. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, but I did what I did want to get out of the way as well was um, as much as we have issue with this movie and don't care for this movie, uh, it's not just because it has a downer ending. No. Nope. We've nope. both watched plenty of films and TV series that are, you know unfortunate, upsetting tragedies, perhaps not in the classical sense where everyone loses, but at least bittersweet. There is, I want to get through the review, because uh, it is a spoiler, but there is a movie with a remarkably similar premise, which has a similar, well, which has a less uh, downer, but similar ending, 
that I fucking love. It's, it's called Nightmare Alley from 1947. Well, I haven't seen that one, so <laughs> oh, that's not okay. fair. All right. uh, given the plot synopsis of Nightmare Alley from 1947, it's definitely better. Uh, definitely 100% better. Um, but this is a movie I've watched and love and has similar beats in it. Uh, I'll, I'll get to that once we're done, though. It's not that it's a downer ending. You can have a downer ending that is good and, if not fun, at least compelling. This is not that. Uh, yeah. If you don't mind, I'll give a quick synopsis of what happens. Please do. Because unlike a lot of the stuff we talk about, I can't assume you've already seen this. It's it's kind of an obscure movie from the last couple of years. Um, so uh, Stan Carlyle, our main character played by Bradley Cooper, is a drifter. He... Uh, joins up with a carnival and does a couple of jobs until he uh, finds tutelage, in rough terms, under a mentalist. Somebody who is pretending to be psychic for money. Um, tragedy after tragedy happens. Uh, he falls in love with, maybe, with a uh, girl who does an electrocution bit. Um, they eventually leave the carnival together. Uh, he becomes a big name in like nightclubs, the two of them working together on his mentalist bit. Uh, he upsets a psychiatrist who he then works with to hoodwink a... it should it should be noted uh, this is an important point upsets a psychiatrist by being mildly rude to her in response to her trying to ruin his show and destroy his career like you do uh... so he was he treated her a little bit less bad than the average heckler gets from a comedian um but uh, they end up working together, not working together. The film is, like, violently and intentionally vague about this because you're supposed to get excited about the cat and mouse. I'm playing you, and I know you're playing me, but who's going to win the playing each other game? When it's very, very obvious from the very beginning that Kate Blanchett's character will be winning the playing each other game because the movie literally, if she was wearing a big fucking clapboard that said I'm going to win, it would be less obvious. Uh, so anyway they try to swindle some specific guy A it bad goes man. poorly and um, uh, she, as you say, Kate Blanchett wins, uh, his life is ruined and he is forced to become a homeless person riding the rails uh, and he ends up going back to the carnival uh, and not in a good way that's the summary, it's super brief, we'll discuss details more as we go through this we have a lot to say, but we don't want to stick around over long just bitching about the movie. Because while it would be enjoyable, it's not really what we do here. Yeah, uh, it would be cathartic for us, but maybe not so much for you guys to listen to. I, I... <sighs> The general thrust of this movie was changed from both of its previous adaptations, and you and I agree that it wasn't good changes. No, but both the original book, the plot of it, and the plot of the movie from the 40s are better. Just full stop. They're better plots. Their twists are more interesting and less predictable. And they're uh, more... They, they feel more like things a human person would do and not actions that only make sense if you're a, if you're a moron robot who's stuck on the plot rails of the thing that's happening. I mean, there are some places to, like, consider outside influences or or direct influences causing various characters in this film to act um, perhaps what one would perceive as unrealistically. But the movie never takes the time to actually tell you that. A lot is left so far buried into the subtext that I might as well have made it up. Yeah, like, there's there's a level of subtext that you can get away with, and if anything that might be redeeming to several aspects of this movie is well below it. It is literally uh, a lot of the things that would make this movie decent out of the not good it is are on the level of um, Fanon as I believe Mr. Frodo is gay. <laughs> Certainly, that is a conclusion you could draw. <laughs> <laughs> it's just oh, and the, the, one of the things that I always find most frustrating about a movie much like this movie and much like uh, The Last Jedi is that if it's really really easy 
for me, off the top of my head, to come up with six or seven ways the plot could have been improved without fundamentally changing anything about the story and requiring maybe one pickup scene. Uh, you did a bad fucking job making the movie. Well, and I, I think the most critical thing that fucks up this movie is... Um, in the original novel and in the 1947 film, Bradley Cooper's character is not a good guy, but a way better guy. A flawed but understandable human being, not a cartoon villain. This movie opens literally with a scene of him burning down a building with a man inside it. Like, that's the, the, before there's any dialogue, there's him dragging a body, which he has clearly killed, and disposing of the evidence. Now, it turns out later that guy was a shitbag anyway, but... <laughs> but regardless, he's, you know, we are not meant to be sympathetic to this man. And it's in stark contrast to the way he acts in the first act of the movie, because it's what shows him to be a con artist deep down. Because he's, like, nice, and he's like, oh, shucks, ma'am, kind of guy, but that's not him. That's we have not, seen the that's dark... That's not the internals. Yeah. So, like, the whole ruse, if there ever was one, is blown by your opening scene. So you, you can't develop empathy for the character that is then undercut when it is revealed he is a shitbag. And that can then give you the level of, of uh, you know, feeling of being hoodwinked to enjoy, to, to find some manner of, of satisfaction in the ironic uh, fucking ham-fisted twist of fate that is his ultimate fate. Um, it's just, well, I mean, this guy was a shitbag and he came to a shitty end. Way to waste two and a half hours of my fucking life. And the story wasn't <laughs> even interesting. Uh, I, half of this movie takes place in a carnival. I love carnivals. I love the, the aesthetics of the carnival. Um, and I expected from Guillermo del Toro something stronger and more evocative or at least meeting these standards, or getting close, touching the heels of these standards, set by Carnival, the HBO series, or fuck even American Horror Story Carnival. Yeah, basically. And you, I was having a fun time at the Carnival. I really was sad when the movie left the Carnival, because I could tell the movie was about to get a whole lot worse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I wasn't as sad because I, you know... I, you weren't having a good time anyway. No, it was it was diet fucking Zevia carnival. It was there was <laughs> no flavor. It generally kind of someone drew a carnival over top of the movie screen that was playing. <laughs> but um, then they moved to the big city and the incredibly obvious double cross plot begins. Yeah, I. Uh, my, one of my chief problems with this movie is that for all that this movie tries desperately to make you think that Bradley Cooper's character is a mustache twirling cartoon villain, he doesn't actually do anything bad enough to merit the comeuppance he gets, aside from one thing which, which the movie leaves open to whether or not it was intentional. He... Uh, kills a guy at the beginning of the movie. Turns out that was his abusive f uh, shitbag father. Um, so, like, bad, but understandable. Um, and then he ruses a bunch of very rich people out of some money. Uh, okay, good. Why am I supposed to be rooting against this? There's another character, the mentor character I discussed in the, in the plot summary, that he... Probably killed. Probably killed. He says it was an accident. The movie leaves it open to interpretation. I would assume it's an intentional thing he does. Just given the rest of this character. Yeah. yeah. And how they don't... So, like, in the other two stories, in the other two versions of this story, and I'm reading this from Wikipedia plot summaries, because I have no fucking... I don't we know haven't seen... I have, certainly haven't read this book, and I haven't seen the movie from the 40s. Um, in, in at least one of them, it is just absolutely an accident. In the other one, I don't know that he's connected to it. No. Uh, in the other one, I don't think he is, the book. And in the movie from the 40s, it is clearly made clear that he accidentally gives this dude wood alcohol instead of moonshine because the psychopath who, who keeps the alcohol keeps them in boxes next to each other. <laughs> he, he is a little bit crazy. Uh, uh, look, so, that's consistent character. That, guy's a com that guy is clearly an evil dickhead. Sure. Um, who, like, probably gets a laugh at, man, maybe someone will poison themselves. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> I imagine the 1940s version, he was like, fucking nice. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't ever expect that to pay off. Uh, but the the thing that is like an unambiguous turning point for the character in the other two versions of the story, they also change here. Um, and that is when... Uh, so he's conducting a seance, a fake seance, for uh, an evil rich man. And he has convinced his girlfriend to play the part of his long-lost love. Um, Wife in some versions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it goes as poorly as you would expect. And um, in the two original versions, uh, the, the, the book and the original movie, uh, she sees how low she has brought this man and can't go through with it. So she breaks character and reveals that it's a ruse intentionally. Uh, and either in, I believe in the book, he freaks out and hits her, thus crossing a moral line, m- making him deserving of his ultimate fate. And in the movie, he, like, just, they, 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 they flee, and then he ultimately, like, yeah. gives her money to get away from this and, and go live a peaceful life elsewhere, because he's trying to be a good guy, even if he's not doing a great job. Whereas in this movie, he freaks out and everything, but he beats the evil rich man to death. And she doesn't break character intentionally. She... It's not that she sees how low she has brought this this man and can't do it, so she breaks character and tells him. It's that this guy charges forward and breaks the ruse himself by, like, getting all up in her space where he can tell it's not her. It's not his, his long-lost love. And then Bradley Cooper's character beats a, a multiple serial rapist to death, and again, I don't know why you want to sell me that that's a bad thing movie, but you're not doing a great job. And... <laughs> It's, there's this, all this, uh, I don't want to condemn Bradley Cooper's performance because he's doing a good job playing a sadistic manipulator who's not as smart as he thinks he is. Yeah, uh, look, he does a great job doing that. But the way the story is framed for the, the modern version we just watched is that he is the good guy. We're meant to be sympathetic toward this guy. We're meant to want him to be like the guy from the 1940s. A flawed but trying character. Right. But the problem is all the actions you have him take are either not that bad or like so over the top ridiculous evil that you you may, you harm our ability to empathize with this person in the first place. And this is a character who the, the nicest and best things he's done have been like a work like they seem so false especially after you know the opening scene where he leaves the burning building uh so we so it feels like a like a con from the beginning so we can't take as writ that this you know all shucks i'm just trying to make my way in the world guy in the first act is his actual personality you have set up that that is not his actual personality and then the rest of the movie treats it like it is and then he he like falls into like you know, drunkenness and and depravity. Which I have to say, it was not a very good job of doing that either. No, no, it does a bad job of doing that. You did a bad job of setting up the story you want to tell, a bad job of setting up the twist, a bad job of executing the twist, and then the twist was lame. It's just fucking top to bottom. It's a page one rewrite. And dude. there were like four <laughs> things at the end that could have been twists, and all of them were bad. It's just, it is a page one rewrite. You fucked all of this from top to bottom, and it would have been so easy to fix. It would have been so easy to not do this. Literally, the other two versions of the story managed it. How did you fuck this up? Well, I think I might have an answer to that, and it might be uh, subconscious or even directly conscious. Uh, Apparently, when Guillermo del Toro was young, his father was kidnapped, and um, some of the advice that the people looking into it told him was... Don't trust the psychics. People will come out of the woodwork and try to scam you with their, you know, psychic visions of where your father is and how he's doing. Uh, you know what? I got this... I actually did get a very... I'm going to call it a Penn Jillette vibe. That's kind of funny because Teller was a consultant for the movie. That makes sense. Uh, that that actually does make sense and I'll explain why. Uh, Penn Jillette virulently hates these people. Yeah. Like hates people who pretend to pray, much like Harry Houdini before him, uh, hates people who prey on the vulnerable nature of the grieving. 
Uh, so that teller was an, a consultant on this movie, probably for the bits of like practical hand magic yes. they have going on. Uh, makes sense because Penn Jillette would probably uh, rubs one out to the idea of these people meeting a horrible, ironic fate that they definitely deserve. <laughs> Yeah, and I don't, I don't necessarily disagree with that mindset. I mean, you know, don't, don't scam sad people. That's fucked up. I mean, unless they're serial rapists, then scam them all you yeah, want. Yeah, scam and then, that guy, and then beat them to death. That is also fine. There's another <laughs> thing that uh, that this in- incarnation changes from both previous incarnations, and that is um, in the book and the uh, 1947 movie, um, the psychiatrist character and Bradley Cooper's character uh, are, are in on the rig from the get go. Like they meet and they decide together. To scam some motherfuckers. It's not a weird cat and mouse game where, like, he thinks he's convincing her to give him information and she's letting him think that because she was a Karen at one of his shows and he was slightly rude to her so she's going to ruin his whole life and just get away with it in the end. Spoilers, uh, Kate Blanchett's character just gets away with it. She comes to a clearly meant for entertainment show. Uh, She acts like a humongous Karen. She stands up and tries to ruin the show for everyone else going. Uh, She gets set down like a heckler should get set down. And then she ruins a man's life, gets rich, and kills uh, people she was scared of, and gets away with it. There is literally no consequences for her character. Uh, And it's it's like, in in the book, and I believe the the movie as well, the, the 1947 movie, he feels bad about all the shit he's been through and in the movie specifically the part he accidentally played in his mentor's death so he goes to get mental help yeah he goes to a psychiatrist whereas in the movie she like rooks him into starting psychiatry which is just insane yeah it's it's absolute like atonal batshit uh and like to be clear I don't have an issue with Kate Blanchett's character winning. Because she does unequivocally win. She comes out like a fucking aces in this. If there's any winner in this movie, it is her character. I don't have an issue with that. I have an issue with her motivation is the equivalent of you saw a black guy walking in the park and got upset that he was near you, so you called the cops. She's an insufferable Karen. And a petty child. And then she gets away with it. If she was just scamming him like from the beginning like she is in the 1940s version where they get together and they're like hey we're kindred spirits let's scam some people and she's all yeah let's scam some people i sure do love scamming people i love scamming people (laughs) hey bud guess what (laughs) that and she's not like a, a weird personal vendetta from this incredibly minor personal inconvenience she suffered because it becomes what does this woman do to people cut her who cut her off in traffic what if someone what if someone were to talk during a movie? What would she fucking boil them in acid? It's such an unbelievable overreaction and it's clearly an emotional overreaction. Like she did this, she maintained this level of virulent hatred for a motherfucker while screwing him. And, like, drawing him in and ruining his life and intentionally getting him addicted to alcohol, which he has avoided his whole life because he knows he'll have a problem with it. What a level of petty, vindictive, insane bullshit. Whereas if she was, like, scamming him, that's that's actually kind of cle- That's actually kind of boss. That's, that's kind of clever. I mean, at the, the end of the day... game's hard, buddy, but you lose. This movie feels like... And you mentioned it. You would see similar plots in a heist movie. This feels like a heist movie without any of the zazz. Without any of the shit that makes a heist movie fun to watch. And it's the same thing about the carnival setup. That carnival was bland. It never got any of the really, you know, deep, interesting character introspection or really actually having to deal with shit that that carnival life you know you had to deal with nothing that you got and again i stress this because i don't think american horror story is a well-written show american horror story would did better oh yeah 100 percent. and that shouldn't you should easily guillermo del toro clear that bar the, the what is it saying the bar was in hell but here you are da- limbo dancing with the devil yeah yeah i <laughs> uh, just I, I want to watch... I almost want to watch the 1940s version to get a better version. I'm not gonna. I'm this. I'm fully done with this after this podcast end. But uh, I almost want to watch the 1940s version just to get a better version of this story where... Where the... Where the... It is just a heist movie and the... The... 
the slightly less good bad guy gets scammed by the better bad guy. That's a cleaner narrative. Yeah. And more more entertaining to watch. I don't understand how you guys fucked this up so so badly. Um, I think we've said most of what we have to say about this film at this point. Would you agree? Um, again, set dressing, very pretty. Uh, the, the set design and uh, costumes, very good. The actors, for the most part, doing really good with the material they have to work with. I wanted to get some compliments in there again. They were the same ones as before because those are the only things available to compliment about this movie. But I, I don't like being this negative about media. It's just this one was this one really pissed me off. It was a frustrating se- and it's two and a half fucking hours. Yeah, it's way too fucking long. This is ninety minutes of story if you fucking stretch. Yeah, um, but uh, I believe there's two things we wanted to cover before we sign off on this. You said you wanted to compare this to another movie you've seen. Yeah, Matchstick Man. Oh, I love that movie. It's this, but better. It is a. Scam artist, a very good scam artist. Preying on old people. Preying on old people, like, and stealing their money, who is doing worse things, because they're not rich old people, like like this, like Bradley Cooper's character, because that's who he was really scamming. He would take, like, nickels and dimes from the lower, from, like, the lower people in the carnival. But, one, but the real scam, the real, the spook show scam started with rich assholes, who I don't have much sympathy for anyway. Uh, but this was Nicolas Cage's character in Matchstick Men is stealing old people's pensions. He is an incredibly skilled con artist who is doing perhaps the most dirty, scummy, low-end shit you can imagine. And then he gets fucking absolutely taken in and rooked and his life destroyed by a better scam artist who uses a very personal connection to get into his life and then ruin it. To take all his money. That is this, but better. Yeah, solidly. It's not that it's a downer ending that's a problem. It's that you did a bad fucking job. Yeah. (laughs) If you're going to have, you know, if you're not going to have a story where there's someone to root for, if you're not going to have a story where, you know, there's a good or at least, like I said, bittersweet ending, you need to have a really good story. And I swear to you guys... There was only one thing about this movie that I didn't accurately predict. I don't remember. I told you what it was. Uh, oh, I thought uh, one of the people they turned into a carnival geek was going to be the son of an important person, and that person was going to come back for revenge. But that was literally the only you, thing that about was this. you putting too much hope in this It movie. really was. I was I was waiting for a shoe to drop. A shoe. Uh, I didn't predict the actually good final line. That was good, but, like, that's an individual line. How could I possibly have? Uh, And I thought there was even odds Kate Blanchett's character was going to literally kill him, as opposed to him ending up, ironically ending up a a, a, a carnival geek when he had looked down upon them earlier in the movie. Because this movie has the subtlety of a brick to the face. Well, that's the fucking thing, is. (laughs) That's one of the few times where he shows any genuine human compassion. No one's around, and he shares his smoke with the carnival geek. Yeah. So he doesn't even... There's not even that, like, you know... It's not even like he was an asshole to the Carnival Geek, so he deserves that. No. It's literally one of the only nice things, one of the only clearly genuinely nice things this dude does, and he's punished for it. It, It's... uh, I... I, And just... You fucked it up. You fucked it up. Uh, We wanted to talk about the reviews. um, Yes. Because they're funny. Uh, The other thing I wanted to mention is... uh, I have, off the top of my head, like, 12 ways to make this a better movie. I'm not going to go into them... Because this movie doesn't deserve it. Uh, what were the reviews? <laughs> we did come up with a lot of really good ones. Uh, you know what? Let us know in the comments if you want to know some. And uh, hopefully we'll remember what they are. Um, so, uh, I, I feel like this is telling. And I'm looping us back around into the topic of why we started the Two Nerds Don't Go to the Movies podcast theme in the first place. Um, which is... <sighs> Everyone says that they're, everything's, uh, you know, too many superhero movies and superhero movies are predictable and blah, 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 blah. And boring and empty and yada, yada, yada. Uh, so uh, this is just Wikipedia. Okay. I'm just on Wikipedia. On the review aggregator website Rotten Tomatoes, 80% of 341 critics reviews are positive with an average rating of 7.4 out of 10. The website's consensus reads, while it may not hit quite as hard as the original, Guillermo del Toro's Nightmare Alley is a modern noir thriller with a pleasantly pulpy spin. 
I don't know what pulp they're watching. Pulp is pulp because it does shit. Shit happens. Things go on. They, there's there shotguns is... shoot. Guys get hung, strung up in an alley. Like, Dames wear red and like, but like shockingly, not like you know. Oh, this that, lady that happens to always yeah. be wearing red. Neat. Interesting. Uh, there's none of the grit of noir. There's none of the darkness. Like they talk about how in here in a review in a second, how this man is descending into madness and like. No, he's not. No, he's descending into alcoholism. And even then, that's only like 15 minutes of the movie. Yeah, most of the movie is just like I, I just wanted to stay in the carnival. <laughs> I just I did. It would have been a better movie. Know where the know where the story is, and it wasn't where you guys took it. Uh, Mark Kermode, what a name! Uh, gave the film five out of five, writing from its bruised color palette to its spiraling descent into madness and degradation. This is deliciously damnable fare. Looking back through the prism of Del Toro's adventurous oeuvre to the existential angst of his vampiric feature debut, Chronos. That's fucking wrong and uh, also kind of gibberish. <laughs> it says nothing. It says nothing. I'm not an idiot. I can boil this down to, you know, what those words mean. And It was surprisingly brown and yellow. I'll give it the bruised color palette. There are a little bit of purples too, yeah. But, yeah. like, it has all the con content of a fart. Uh, the Jewish Chronicle gave it a 5 out of 5. Uh, Del Toro employs a mixture of stylish old Hollywood sensibilities with B-movie tropes to bring us an engaging and gorgeously acted psychological thriller. Um, this was not a psychological no, thriller. No, no. It was, a, this was it was a fable at best. This was a poorly executed heist movie. There was no psychological thriller in this. The characters weren't psychologically deep enough to be believable. They were talky stereotypes, bro. Uh, Peter <laughs> Bradshaw of The Guardian gave the film a 4 out of 5 and uh, praised it as a spectacular noir melodrama boasting gruesomely enjoyable performances and freaky twists. Uh, Peter Bradshaw of The Guardian has freaky? never seen a story in his life. Freaky? This is Peter Bradshaw's first review. It has to be. Are I'm giving him that fucking, credit. <laughs> are you fucking, like... Are you the guy from... What is what is that fucking movie where a guy come lives in like a bunker? I don't know. I'm oh. only thinking of the pickle guy from that one. Uh, that guy who gets sealed in a pickle barrel with Seth Rogen. No, I haven't watched um, that. I kind of want to. Brendan Fraser, uh, Blast from the Past. Are you the oh. guy from Blast from the Past? Have you been living in a fucking bunker for the last thirty years of your life? What? Name one freaky thing that happens in this movie. I guess a lady gets lightninged as like a bit, and there's a weird baby in a jar. Yeah, uh, Guillermo del Toro was in fact here. <laughs> but no, bro! No, no. Uh, now we get some sensible reviews. Robbie Collin of the Daily Telegraph was more critical, giving the film two out of five stars and describing it as an act of origami-level homage. It's all folded together in impressively fiddly ways, but the result is an angular, inert approximation, lacking the original's breadth or heat. That is both true and fire, might I add. Uh, Kevin Marr of the Times gave it two out of five stars, praising its set design, but added there's little else in this drastically overstretched narrative Parentheses 150 minutes exclamation point and parentheses to hold any attention beyond a cursory awareness that yes, we're watching an oddly literal melodrama about bad people doing very bad things very slowly. <laughs> yes. True again. Great job. And I think there is nothing better to close on than the greatest uh, villain uh, against superhero media the world has ever known. Martin Scorsese authored an essay in the Los Angeles Times urging readers to seek out the film, crediting Del Toro's films as being lovingly and passionately crafted, and arguing that Nightmare Alley is truer to the animating spirit of film noir than the many homages that have been made over the years and are still being made now. I want to make it clear. If that sounded like a thing that you would pay attention to, and... You are and 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 you're you're thirsting for you know, right, comic book movies. Oh, they're so bad. Oh, right, comic book movies. I want a movie where shitty awful people bo are boring and do shitty awful things to each other and karma who do their way out of consequences. And it's super overly long. This movie is for you. By all means, go forth. Sin no more. See this movie. 
I don't know that the movie is because, like, I like those things you mentioned. I do. I enjoyed uh, Gangs of New York, which is exactly that by descriptor. That's I fair. believe you were a fan of um, There Will Be Blood. Yeah, uh, but... which is exactly that descriptor. Absolutely, uh, but like, good though. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but if this Martin Scor- Martin Scorsese, if this is what you call cinema. By all means, there are many people who your 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 opinion is be above reproach. You could never be wrong. You and all of those people can go have fun watching this fucking useless trek on your own. I'm gonna go watch a fucking robot man punch a gorilla. Fuck you guys. <laughs> uh, we will be doing more of these as we continue to watch films because obviously one film isn't indicative of an entire you know. No, that's fun. That's yeah. a fun bit. But come on. Uh, so, uh, we will be back to talk about them, because... Everything's better when nerds talk about it. Oh, that is not what I thought you were going to say.